Hey, it's Ranger Russ at the Meg's Point Nature Center. Very excited to come to you again live from the Meg's Point Nature Center. I need to remind everyone that the Nature Center is closed. Uh, I know that a lot of you are visiting the park and it's great to see you. And I do see people coming up, trying the door, reading the sign. I'm really sorry that the building is closed. I can't wait for us to open so that you can experience these things a little more substantially. The programs are great. I love doing them, uh, but I think interacting with you would be a lot more fun. I'd be able to answer your questions more directly. So we're working towards that. But in order to do that, I need to ask them things of you. First of all, we need to maintain social distance, whether we're outside, inside, wherever you are, you need to maintain social distance. Visiting the parks is no exception. So please keep that six foot, 20 mice difference, distance between you and the people that you're encountering. If you can't keep that social distance, you need to cover your face. Uh, a lot of people are covering their faces anyway, which I think is, a, it's a good precaution to take. You also need to wash your hands, really wash your hands. Soap and water, warm soap and water, wash your hands, cover your face completely if you have to cough, if you're not wearing a mask. Um, don't touch your face. What are all the other things? I think that covers it. So let's keep on doing these things. I know it's been a long time. People are really anxious. You get in spring fever. You want to get out. You want to do things. You still need to maintain social distance. So come and visit the parks. Please follow the rules though. If the park is closed, find another park because we have lots of parks in Connecticut and they're all fantastic. If you say, oh, well, my favorite park is Hammond Asset. I really want to go there. There are some really great parks and I'm kind of partial to Hammond Asset. I'm here all the time. I'm still not tired of being here. I've been here 20 years and I'm still excited to come to work every day because I never know what I'm going to see. But if it's full, find another park. If it's crowded, go someplace else and you're going to enjoy it no matter where you go. All right, please keep posting where you're from as we go. Ask your questions. If I miss it, you can repost it. That's fine. Today we're talking about another one of my favorite animals, a really special animal. I hope that you'll all agree. Okay, so it is a type of a clam. This is just half of the shell. So this is a bivalve. Normally there would be two. I have a smaller one, not a, one the same size, but normally there are two. Okay, that is where the name bivalve comes from, two shells. We've talked about some other bivalves, so if you want to see more information about the animals that we've done, go to our uh, Meg's Point Nature Center Virtual Learning Center, Meg's Point Nature Center uh, website, megspointnaturecenter.org, the Virtual Learning Center. All the programs are ar archived, and I have done a program on some other bivalves in the past, so be sure to check those out. So today's bivalve is a quahog, really amazing uh, creature. This is a clam. They can live over a hundred years. Now worldwide, there are 12,000 species of, of clams around the world. A lot of clams out there. The longest lived animal in the world that we know of lived 507 years. It was a clam. It was an Icelandic species of clam and they aged it at 507 years. Now, you can tell the age of a clam because if you look closely, see if I can get that to focus. Is it focusing for you? You can see all of those ridges. Those are growth rings. Now we've talked about the growth rings on trees and we've talked about the growth rings on other shellfish. Those rings, if you count them, can tell you how old the clam is. And a quahog lives over 100 years. I haven't counted the rings on this one, but it's a really amazing animal. They're also called hard clams because they've got a really super thick, hard shell. So that's really cool. Now I have a live quahog over here. So I always call this our touch tank. This is not a touch tank. This is an observation tank. We do allow you to touch things in it, but you need to have a staff or a volunteer 
when we're handling the animals. So if I call it a touch tank, that's just because for 20 years it was, it's not any longer. We need to protect our animals a little bit differently now. So if you look, this is a live quahog, hard clam. Many of you have eaten clams, and quahog is probably the main one in this area that you're gonna be eating. Now, if you've ever had one in your hand and tried to open it with just your hands, we're not gonna be able to open this. As much as I try, I cannot get into this shell. It is really strong, has a very hard shell. If you remember our program we did on lobsters, lobsters can crush and break these shells with their crushing claw. They're probably gonna be able to crush this one pretty easily. The bigger ones like this, it might be a little harder. You'd need a really big lobster to get into this one. But this is a clam. And clams have something really cool inside of them. It's kind of like our tongue. It's soft and flexible and muscular. And it is called their foot. And they use their foot to slide around. Okay, so they can dig a channel. Sometimes you'll see a line in the sand and at the end of that line will be one of these, a quahog. So they use that, that foot to move around. Again, it it's, feels like our tongue if you were to grab a hold of it. They also have a siphon, so they will use their foot to dig down in the mud and then they will extend their siphon out. It's a straw. It sucks water down into the clam because they're filter feeders. They're filtering out anything that's floating in the water and they do sometimes get things that they shouldn't get. So if there are harmful minerals, heavy metals like zinc or things like that, may get into the clam. And we use the clams as an indicator species. This indicates how healthy our water is because they're filtering out some of those things that don't belong. But they're also filtering out things that they're gonna eat. They help clean the water. So every time they suck water in, when they squirt it back out, the water is gonna be a little cleaner. Really amazing, I love that, that they help clean uh, Long Island Sound. For Connecticut, they're cleaning Long Island Sound. In other parts of the world, they will clean your bodies of water. So Chesapeake Bay, um, Cape Cod Bay, these guys are cleaning, they're helping clean the water, they help clean the ocean. Lots of people like to eat them if you've ever had steamers, I guess, in this area. Now, I don't eat clams. I am a vegetarian, so I've never eaten uh, meat, so I've never had one, but people say that these are delicious. And in the summertime, all along the shoreline here, all of our clam shacks, you will see lines and lines of people to get these clams. So they're a very, very popular food. In Britain, years ago, they had a couple of cold spells, one in the 40s and then in 62 and 63, and it wiped out their native soft shell clam. This clam was introduced and it took the niche of that clam. So this is not listed as an invasive species in Britain. This was brought there intentionally, it was released, and it took the niche of an animal that had been wiped out. So they do have these over there, um, and they, they like to eat them there too. I wanna show you, let's put that one back in the water. So we looked at the inside of this one, and you can see this little mark right here. That's the muscle scar. If you've seen our, our uh, oyster program, I talked about the muscle scar. That is the muscle that holds the clam shut. So when I'm trying to open it, you know, I'm using all of my muscles to try and get it open. Um, they only are using one muscle, really one muscle to close it, uh, but they, they have a couple of muscles inside of them. So they are trying to hold themselves closed. Now, if you look on the inside of this one, you see that really brilliant purple color? Absolutely amazing purple color that you can get inside of a quahog. Now, a very long time ago, the Native Americans in this area, now they still do it, but back then it was a lot more important. They used to make these into beads, which they called wampum. Wampum was not money. A lot of people trying to associate it with money. It wasn't money. They had a barter system. So they made beads. All of the shoreline tribes would make beads. 
Most of the beads were going to be white because most of the shell is white. But you could get some purple beads, okay, which were a little more valuable than the white beads. They would take those beads and trade them all over New England. You can find wampum from here uh, in upstate New York and into Canada because that was a trade item. So they would send, they would pack these up there. They would get furs and pelts and all sorts of different things that they had. They would get flint to make their spear points, which we didn't have down here. And then they would bring it down. So back and forth, this got traded all over New England. This was a trade item. They would make beads out of it. Now, I've tried to make a bead. They are not easy. It's a time-consuming thing. So that's why these beads were very, very valuable. And again, the purple, because it's harder to get, was even more valuable. Okay, let's see if we have any questions. Somebody's talking about the uh, difference between the touch tank and the observation tank. Is the Quahog local New England name? Yes. So it is a local name. Uh, they do call other clams around the world, though, Quahogs, okay? But I'm pretty certain that the name came from New England native tribes, the name Quahog, so. Let's see if we have any other questions here. Someone's from Maryland, so you guys have these down there. Very popular food in Maryland, I'm sure. Oh, so someone's asking about the ridges per year. Very good question. Now, I've mentioned this before with other things, even with the, with the trees, it's the same. A growth ring is really a growth season. Typically, that's one year. Sometimes you could get a growth ring in the spring and then a really harsh summer and then another growth ring in the fall. So you could get two good growth rings in a year. Sometimes you won't get any growth rings in a year. If it's a harsh year, not a lot of food for whatever reason, lots of storms, and the quahog isn't able to really grow, it's gonna be a much smaller ridge that is close to the other ridges and you really can't distinguish them from another growth ridge. So it averages out to one ring a year. Very typical, it's good to say growth season though because it's not necessarily a growth season. So great question. I'm gonna see if we have, how large was the oldest clam? So that Icelandic clam gets pretty large. Um, I think that they said that they are around a foot across, but they could be even larger. For, I'm thinking a 500 year old clam is gonna be pretty big. I didn't see how, uh, how large that clam was. This is a good size, they do get larger. So I would say this one, and there are lots of rings, I haven't counted, but I'm gonna say there's 80 or 90 rings here. So these get 100 years old, you can imagine it being a little bit larger than this one. Ah, hello from Norway, hello Norway. Lebanon. Any other questions? All right, I think we've answered a lot of them. How's the population doing? Good question. Long Island Sound, the water is getting warmer, so our species are changing a bit. Lobsters are harder to find. Welks are easier to find. The clams are starting to do a bit better because we've cleaned the water. We're also doing a lot of programs where they are seeding clams and oysters. Mainly it's oysters, but farmers are farming clams. So it's a pretty good sign. Uh, we are seeing a bit more clams in the sound than we have in the past. Can't imagine how long it would take to make a bead out of a shell. It, yes, it's difficult. I would love to get someone on that's done it and explain the process. I was just trying to sand it and grind it and it wasn't turning out very well. So they have, the question's how many muscles they have, I'm gonna answer that one. 
They have two muscles. You can see there's a scar here and a scar here. The abductor and adductor. I'm going to get those names wrong. And then they have their foot, which is a muscle. So as far as I know, that's it. They might have another small muscle around their stomach, but that's it for muscular. There's just three main muscles inside of a clam. They have a little digestive system in there that the filtered uh, water filters the things out. Now, let's say when these are, are young, they start out planktonic. And I mentioned plankton a lot. It's a good word to keep reminding you of though. Plankton are microscopic things, either plants or animals. So if it's an animal, it's zooplankton. If it's a plant, it's phytoplankton. These start out as zooplankton, which means they could be filtered out by their own parents uh, when they're little tiny, you know, swimming around. Once they start growing, they will establish a shell. They don't start out with a shell. The shell starts growing and then they settle to the bottom and they're going to live the rest of their lives there. So again, that's what being a filter feeder means. You're filtering out anything that's in the water. How do they make beads out of clams? They make beads out of the shell and this shell is pretty thick. It's getting close to a quarter inch thick in the thickest part. Um, so you would grind that down. They would make long tubular ones or round ones, lots of different shaped beads, but you would grind them down and somehow drill a hole. That's the part that I can't figure out. I can do it with a modern drill, but I don't know how they did it years ago. They must have had some really fine, uh, very patient to get that drilled out. Why are clams strong? So Thomas, clams need to be strong because they're not fast. They're stuck on the bottom. That means that other animals would be able to eat them. So every crab, even fish, if they picked them up and they weren't, didn't have a really strong shell or weren't able to hold themselves closed, lots of animals would be able to open them and get the meat out of the inside. So that the strength in those muscles really helps protect them. If anything comes near, remember they've got a siphon and a foot that stick out, they withdraw both the foot and the siphon, seal themselves up, and now it's really hard to get them. Again, the lobster can break the shell, but not a lot of other animals can get through the shell of the clam. So they need to have a strong shell and those strong muscles so that everything isn't eating them. It limits what's able to eat them. So good question there. What makes the purple color? Great question. I know there's a purple pigment in there, but I don't know why that part of the shell is purple. The other thing is, if a shell has been out in the sun a long time, you can see the purple color fades. This shell we found washed up on the beach and the color has faded quite a bit. You can still see a little purple up there. But the purple, if you look closely, it's always on the outer edge here. And then for some reason on this side of the shell, it tends to be stronger. But I'm not sure why it is only there and then the rest of it is white. Perhaps as it grows, it just, the purple fades into white. All right, let's take a look at the live one again because there's something else I want to show you. With many clams, okay, if you hold the clam this way, so the foot would be down here, the siphon extends in this direction. This part right here, this little, this is the joint. So that's where it opens and closes from. This is called the umbo. I love that word, umbo. That's the, the curved part here. For a quahog, if you notice, the umbo is lopsided. It's way off to the back, okay? With most clams, it's a little more central, okay? It's even like this. Even if the joint is further to one end or the other, the shape of the shell seems to be more even. The quahog is the only one in this area that has that lopsided umbo. The umbo leans in one direction. So I think that's pretty cool that it can do that. There we go, that's pretty much in focus. All right. So again, because they're filter feeders, we have to put things in the water for them to filter out, which means they're competing with the tank filter. So we put in uh, brine shrimp and tube flex worms and also anything, if another animal eats 
and then poops, all animals have to poop, they will filter out the poop, so they will eat the organic matter that's left over from that. And if they are eating a chunk of a fish or anything, they will eat the chunks that are missed, that are floating around in the water, the chunks that are too small for the other animals to eat, they're gonna eat them. So I know it's a little gross, but that's what makes them great filters for Long Island Sound. They keep Long Island Sound nice and clean. All right, we're gonna put that one back. And I'm not seeing any more questions. So let's go back, remind everybody that the parks are open. Please follow the rules. Don't go into a park if it's closed. If the gate's closed, don't park out in front and walk in. Uh, that will get you a ticket in, in uh, most towns and in front of most parks. I'm gonna be do continuing these programs. So from Tuesday to Friday at 11 o'clock, you can see these programs and at two o'clock. You can also visit megspointnaturecenter.org at the Virtual Learning Center and see all the videos archived plus a whole lot of information that we have put on there. So vocabulary words that go with the videos and some really fun things to do in your homes or around your homes. So we have craft activities and things like that. Someone's asking, can I talk about the oldest ones if you haven't already? I did mention the oldest clam, which is the Icelandic clam. that was over 500 and our local clams can get to be 100. So very, very cool. And they keep growing. Doing any more stories? So I will be doing some more Native American stories, uh, maybe not illustrated, maybe just telling a story. Uh, those I do off the top of my head, I like that a little bit better than the illustrated ones because I have to follow a sort of a script. We also have John Himmelman has read a few more books. If you got to see his program on Friday, we, we played him doing one of his books. He's got some more books, I'm really excited to do them. I'm gonna try and associate an animal with the book that he's doing, so it's a lot of fun. John's a great guy and does a great job reading his stories. So yes, we're gonna do more stories. I'm gonna, I'll lay out a little bit what my plan is. In the morning, we'll do an animal. In the afternoon, it will either be a craft, a plant, a visit to another park, or a story. So you'll see some different things throughout the week. And again, you can see them on our YouTube channel, uh, Meg's Point Nature Center's YouTube channel. So that's all you have to search for. You can follow us there, follow us on Facebook, like us on Facebook. That really helps tell your friends that you're enjoying it and maybe more people will join in and we'll just keep this going. When the building opens, I do plan on continuing these online programs so you can see them continue. And I won't have to talk about uh, coronavirus anymore. That would be nice. So, any other questions? All right, I wanna thank you all for watching. Again, tune in this afternoon at two o'clock. We'll be have another special program every day from, or every Tuesday to Friday at 11 and two o'clock. I will be on Facebook Live. So I will see you all this afternoon at two o'clock.